um, we have made this brief as a way to synthesize a very complex piece of uh, pieces of international law into more simple terms and also to uh, discuss uh, European Union law, European Union acquis in terms of um, cannabis legalization. So how how is how, how can we what are the steps that we can take to um, legalize cannabis when we are an EU member and when we are a member of the different treaties and international laws that relate to cannabis. So that's what we discuss in the brief and that what what I'm going to briefly <laughs> briefly present the brief uh, today. So I can't Okay, so we often hear about these three conventions, three treaties, um, but it's important to remember that only one is relevant for us, the first one, um, indeed the 71 convention, um, although it does list THC in its schedules, it only applies to pure THC compounds and molecules, pure THC isolated from the herbal drugs, uh, isolated from the herbal cannabis, it doesn't affect uh, plant products, the plant of cannabis, and the cultivation of the plants whatsoever. So it has no relation with adult use, which adult use concerns herbal cannabis, as we know, not pure THC. Um, the 88 convention um, is um, also not relevant because it's, as the title says, a convention on illicit activities and illicit traffic. It does not affect licit activities. Um, it does not affect activities that are legally regulated by um, particular government. So it has no relation with um, legally regulated cannabis. So we are left with the 61 convention, which does regulate herbal products and does include uh, different uh, provisions on licit and authorized activities. Therefore, if we are to authorize uh, some licit activities for recreational cannabis, we have to look at that particular treaty. Um, importantly, and somehow that makes everything more simple, but there is no EU law on licit cannabis, except for medical, but we're not talking about medical here. On licit, on non-medical recreational cannabis, there is no EU legislation or provision uh, regulating it or saying what government should do, should not do. There are a lot of EU law on non, uh, sorry, on illicit cannabis, not on licit cannabis. But we know that the single convention, ipso facto, it is a part of the European Union acquis, EU, EU law. So you have to uh, consider that it's not like there is no um, EU provisions for the licit cannabis related activities there is one it's the single convention because it's full part of eu law so we have this uh, this this situation which makes it more simple because there are less things to analyze it's just one treaty that serves both internationally and for within the eu and importantly in case of breaching the obligation of the single convention Internationally, if there is some dispute, it would be settled by the International Court of Justice as it's planned in the 61 Convention. And in terms of <clears throat> the EU law, because it's part of EU law, it could be subject of an infringement procedure from the Commission, the EU Commission, and uh, it could end up at the European Court of Justice. Um, importantly, uh, side note, but important to recall, the INCB is not... Um, uh, is, has nothing to see with this history of uh, breaching the, 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 the convention or uh, establishing a rightful uh, 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 interpretations of the, the convention. The INCB has no legal mandate, no legal expertise, no legal capacity. It is a body, independent treaty body here to monitor certain licit activities, to monitor specific points, not to give any legal opinion on treaty interpretation. There is no lawyer at the INCB, so simply by by, by that, uh, it should give us some sort of indication. No, the INCB uh, can interpret the treaties if they want. If they do so, it's just an opinion that they are giving, a very uh, interesting opinion, but nothing more than an opinion, no legal value whatsoever. Um, importantly also, it should be said that every time in the last 
decades the NCB has given an opinion. It was an extremely conservative, extremely reactionary opinion. So their opinion have no legal value and may not be the more neutral and balanced opinion that that could exist in uh, the uh, international arena. So back to our brief. Our brief, therefore, based on these findings, um, discusses the 11 possible options that you can see here resume on this on this graph on screen so we are going to take it into in two parts but um importantly we have here yellow options and blue options we're not going to look at the blue options because they are they require previous uh, prior changes either in international law that means amending the convention for instance or in the status of ratification of the convention that means leaving the convention withdrawing for it or um, so on because uh, um, the convention is part of eu law this would require uh, that's what we explain in our brief changing the convention would require an agreement of all uh, eu member states in some cases it would also uh, imply that the commission the european commission has a central role to play on these changes which we may not necessarily see as the best uh, negotiator on our behalf so it also means that uh, you cannot withdraw you cannot withdraw because you cannot withdraw from uh, eu law like that it's not that doesn't happen that way because the single convention is part of eu law you can't withdraw from eu law um first part of this graph we have to analyze two questions two preliminary steps in the interpretation of the treaty which are the basics um what is the goal of the treaty what is this treaty here for we call that the object and purpose and traditionally, traditionally <laughs> strange tradition but uh, classically in the last decades it has been considered that the uh, particularly since the 80s actually it has been considered that the uh, goal of the treaty is prohibition of drugs whereas when we read the treaty it's actually uh, the health and welfare of humankind that's what's mentioned in the preamble and in many occasions uh, prohibition is only mentioned as one possible option here to reach the ultimate goal which is the health and welfare of humankind so the goal is not uh, prohibition of drugs and it's better because if it was obviously we could not legalize something that we are required to prohibit uh, that's why it's a blue option so we have to go for the and it makes sense uh, common sense to go for what is written in the treaty which is the fact that the goal of the convention is to protect the health and welfare of humankind this uh, gives us a first legal obligation that is that we have to reflect in our national legalization bill um, this goal, the goal of the bill, must be also to protect the health and welfare of humankind. And then we have the second question, which is, what is abuse? How do we consider uh, the term abuse in the convention? Because it's not defined in the convention, but it's used extensively, and there is an obligation to fight against abuse. So if we consider that abuse is recreational use, like some people do, obviously, uh, um, we have an obligation to fight against it so we can't legalize it if we consider that abuse is rather something like dependence or a specific uh, harmful uses or a substance use disorder as we call it today then we, we can actually legalize cannabis because uh, there is no obligation to fight any recreational use but just an obligation to fight substance use disorder which also makes sense in terms of coherence with protecting the health and welfare of humankind and that gives us a second obligation we need to um, include the harm reduction and the prevention of substance use disorder uh, as measures within the bill for legalization uh, once we have established this we we continue to the different options so as we said we forget about the blue options uh, let's go just with the yellow options and we are left with two two options basically so as i said it looks complex but if you consider that being an eu member state you cannot really go for the blue option except on the long time frame if you want to legalize 
without waiting 10 years, we, you have to go for these two remaining options, which are either a scientific experiment that is framed under the concept of medical and scientific purposes uh, in the convention, or um, the Article 2, Paragraph 9 option, the non-medical industry option, which is framed in the convention as sometimes it's non-medical, sometimes it's other than medical and scientific purposes, which is a synonym in the convention. That's the non-medical industry option. So these are the two options that can be uh, resumed in that graph. It's to say this circle represents any possible use that you can make of cannabis or for that purpose, any other drug in Schedule 1 of the convention. But here we talk about um, just cannabis. Obviously, so we have abuse that we consider as only part of the use that is substance use disorder, that are these uses that are concerning in terms of health for the user, but that's not all. And then, what, so we have to fight against that. We have to try to, let's imagine, reduce this triangle because we have to reduce the extent of abuse and we have to um, prevent it and, and so on. But then we have medical and scientific purposes and non-medical purposes, other than medical and scientific purposes. Um, here is where we usually uh, frame, we place hemp, what we call hemp in that category. So hemp is the use of some products of the fiber, the seed, or the leaves, the roots, or in the buds of um, some cannabis plants. Usually products that do not have this uh, mind altering effects. Um, so when we want to legalize cannabis, these two options that we were considering is correspond to the scientific experiment, correspond to placing recreational cannabis legalized in the realm of the blue medical and scientific purposes uh, legal regime. And we have the other option that is a non-medical industry where in the end uh, legalized cannabis is uh, similar to industrial hemp, but with higher THC content in terms of legal regime. And here we have some complications that we can't avoid, but for each of these two options, we have two different legal regimes. One for the cultivation of the plants and its harvest. And then we have another legal regime that is for everything that comes after. So that's uh, production, extraction, preparation, transformation, transport, stocking, selling, brokerage, dispatch, and so on. Uh, so let's start with that latest part, the use of products, the industry obligation for everything that comes after cultivation. If we go for the medical and scientific purposes, the industry regulated will be a pharmaceutical industry. So we, and it's, it will be a, a, an experiment of pharmaceutical cannabis, medical, it, uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, yes, cannabis produced in pharmaceutical conditions because the legal regime is the same as for medical use. Medical and scientific goes together in the same sentence always because it's the same legal concept um, in the single convention, therefore also in EU law. So we would have to go with all of the medical obligation, the obligations that prevail for medical cannabis that we know are extremely burdensome, not only in the single convention, but the additional layer of EU law. This includes, of course, medical prescriptions upon dispensation. This includes general medicalization of the sector and framing the war legalized cannabis under a pharmaceutical and medical sector uh, supply chain approach. Um, this also includes um, comprehensive um, uh, comprehensive licensing of every actors at every step of the um, of the discussion. Um, this it's important also to um, remember that the medical uh, uh, regime that would be the same for the scientific experiment involves um, collecting, first of all, involves estimating the uh, data, so the, the, the kilos, the number of plants, estimating everything for every step in advance, sharing it with the NCB. And that's the real role of the NCB is collecting data like that. And um, so sending estimates of every step, cultivation, harvest, Processing, brokerage, stocking, sale, retail, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
sending that to NCB and then at the end of the year collecting the final data and comparing if we had estimated properly or not as with the final data and so on and so forth and um, that could be eventually uh, in the hand of the NCB to address the possible discrepancy between estimates and reported data so it's, it's, it's extremely burdensome and we don't have any of this for the non-medical industry approach where article 2 paragraph 9 only requires First, an additional set of harm reduction measures. Countries have to apply any means that are in their power to reduce the extent of uh, abuse and to reduce harms from cannabis. So it's a strong incentive to harm reduction. And uh, B, they have to report to NCB, but contrary to the scientific experiment where everything has to be reported and estimated in advance, here we don't have estimates. We just need to report at the end of the year and we report just one figure which is the retail at the end of the at the end of the the, the the supply chain so it's much 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 more lighter for the government that doesn't have to implement a full bureaucratic monster of administration to handle the 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 fig all of the figures and obviously the other obligation of harm reduction is 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 common sense and and very useful and then we have, the, as I said, the other regime for uh, the cultivation of the plant. And here, same thing for medical and scientific purposes. We have just like for um, medical use, extremely burdensome um, set of regulation of obligations for countries that are repercuted for extremely burdensome system for farmers, just like for med the cultivation of medical cannabis, which, as we know, is not the most um light uh set of regulations generally and that's imposed by the treaty by these obligations uh whereas again for non-medical cultivation or non-medical industry cultivation uh, article 28 paragraph 2 uh, exempts uh comprehensively uh, the cultivation from any obligation so there is no obligation at all it's just like hemp there is no obligation to report anything, to license anything. It's totally free, which doesn't mean that the country, which doesn't mean that it must be free, which means that just there is no obligation on governments. Then government can decide to apply whatever uh, uh, regulation they want to, to hemp cultivation or to non-medical cannabis cultivation. In that case, they can decide to apply licensing, but for instance, instead of a heavy licensing drug control types of licensing they could apply a much more simple um, way of, of licensing farmers which is lighter which is uh, much more much more cost efficient and much more efficient generally um, in terms of policy so uh, this doesn't mean that there is no regulation i mean that there is no obligation from the treaty and regulations are up to the sovereign decision of every country, in this case, the Czech Republic. So this is a bit, uh, in a nutshell, uh, what the two options um, represent. This is another way to think uh, that. Uh, so either we go for the, the full drug control, just like medical, going into an experiment, or we go with the exemption from the control, almost complete exemption, with the uh, industrial non-medical um, cannabis and so i uh, skip on that um, in terms of precedence importantly there is no precedent for the scientific experiment uh, the scientific purpose uh, approach it's not been uh, attempted by anybody uh, for cannabis it has been attempted for um, other drugs, uh, for instance, heroin in Switzerland, but it was very different. However, the non-medical purposes does have two, at least two textual examples that we will see uh, shortly. But for uh, cannabis under the scientific experiment, there is no uh, no precedent, and this is uh, very simple to understand. This, this option may look appealing, but it has no legal ground. Actually, as Martin Jorsma was uh, saying in the post recently, there's, the Dutch government has deliberately decided uh, not to use the scientific purpose um, legal uh, justification, even though that they present their project like that. 
uh, and we have this uh, scholarly article that is explaining uh, extensively that this option has no legal grounds whatsoever and would not hold before any court in case of a dispute. We also, in the brief, analyze that and we, we conclude, in addition, that besides all of this uh, system that is unfit for non-medical use, that will probably uh, generate insatisfaction among the, the core, the key people uh, to which the reform is addressed, the people who use cannabis, that would have to, for instance, still be prescribed the cannabis and so on. Um, also, this extremely burdensome system is likely to indirectly favor the continuation of um, illicit market, okay. pa parallel markets, and that's not necessarily what, what I, if I understand what is the goal of the reforms. So um, that's um, a lot of arguments that make us, in the brief, not recommend this uh, option. For the other option, the non-medical industry, we do have precedence, although not entirely acted, but at least textual precedence. In Malta, in the law that was passed, the language that is used in the first or second article of the law, I think, is exactly the same as Article 2, Paragraph 9 of the single convention. Uh, purposes, orders, and medif medical and scientific. Um, so it's uh, this language is, find, is found only in Article 2, Paragraph 9 of the convention. So if you see that in a law about recreational cannabis, it's uh, an important sign that you have to look in the convention at that particular article. And we know that article requires two things, implement strong harm reduction measures and uh, submit data at the end of the year to the INTB. There is in the law provisions to implement strong harm reduction measures. And as for the second part, that is sending data to the INCB, we'll see, because for the moment, Malta has not started Act actively uh, uh, dispensating cannabis to people who use it in the country so they have no data to collect and to report but when they start doing it at the end of the year they will have to uh, report that data to NCB and by reporting data they will uh, finish to activate their um, compliance uh, with the single convention and therefore with EU law as well. Another country that uh, is in that case of uh, using this same legal option is not in the EU, but is a neighbor of yours in the Czech Republic. Um, it's Switzerland. So Switzerland is very interesting because they they use actually the rhetorics, the political rhetorics of a scientific experiment. They say, OK, we're going to make pilot studies of um, legal cannabis. But if you look at the law, if you look at the text, the legal strategy is the non-medical industry. They are doing pilot studies of non-medical cannabis industries. So they have chosen a, a very Swiss way of doing in between um, uh, that, that leaves all doors open somehow. Uh, but that, as the, if you look at the law, again, it mentions terminology from nowhere else than Article 2, Paragraph 9 in the treaty, the non-medical Purposes, it has also this obligation of harm reduction reflected by an important, robust public health and harm reduction approach in the law, in the decree of application of the law of these pilot studies. I think it's available in, in English and German and French and Italian on their website. So is, there is no excuse not to go read the Swiss law. I think it's Article 9 on the health tube as a last revision. And if you um, look at what are the uh, op, what are the, the specific regulations, the condition of the law? There is no uh, prescription required, no licensing of cultivation, no pharmaceutical rule, no embed into any sort of medical system, which are all requirements for the scientific experiment. So that means that either they go for a scientific purpose way and they are totally in violation of the convention, or actually they are going for the Article 2, Paragraph 9, no medical industry. And therefore, at least textual in the law so far is compliant. Um, again, it's just like Malta, they are starting, they will start soon, or they have started, I'm not sure, but cannabis will be dispensated this year in Switzerland in some pilot projects. And by the end of the year, with the data that Switzerland has collected, um, they may be able to submit it to the NCB. And once they have done that, that's well explained in the commentary. 
they will have activated uh, um, their compliance with the full exemption of the narcotics regime for uh, non-medical cannabis. So uh, again, Switzerland, very good uh, approach, very good uh, strategy, legally going for the non-medical industry under the terms of Article 2, Paragraph 9, but politically, in terms of geopolitics, in terms of uh, communication, going for presenting that as a pilot study. And actually, these are pilot studies, if you read the law, but they go for the non-medical industry option legally, and then they establish the scientific experiment solely on the terms of Swiss law. It's uh, under the framework of the exemption for non-medical industry that they establish the experiment, not under the framework of scientific experiment in the convention. And that's very different. And that's very, very interesting as a strategy to move forward, I believe. So if you want to see more on this uh, legal interpretation of the convention, I recommend this, this, these documents. But to get back to the, the brief, you have other elements. I focused today on the two options that are on the table for discussion in the Czech Republic, but um, and that are also that were discussed in Switzerland and in Malta, as you can see, um, and the Netherlands. But we, I, I invite you really to go have a look at the brief because we analyze much more in depth some elements, also always trying to keep it simple. There may be some, um, you know, some, 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 some things that are missing because it's um, very complex. Nobody is uh, perfect, but the, the intent and uh, I believe the result was to have the most comprehensive as possible and most uh, insightful view into what is really the state of affairs in terms of legal obligation under international and EU law. And that's, um, it's, there is not much uh, information in that respect, or it's very uh, split around the different different uh, specific papers. So this is one of the few attempts to synthesize a bit um, in one brief document, all of the issues at stake. Uh, we also address the internal market in the EU, and that's a very interesting, a complex, but interesting um, topic, and very briefly, because I know I'm short on the time, but a priori, cannabis uh, products, non-medical recreational cannabis that is licit in a country, it will be considered a good in terms of uh, EU law. Um, so if cannabis is licit under similar terms in two countries of the EU, it will be goods in these two countries. And it's, uh, there is, it's very hard to hinder the trade uh, of goods uh, between borders in the EU because it's one of the, the four freedoms in the EU. So a priori, uh, it's not what is often presented, eh? but a priori, uh, cross-border trade within the EU, within countries that have legalized under similar terms and that both agree to that uh, cross-border trade, uh, that uh, such trade uh, would be possible without without problem. Um, similarly, it will also be, it will also be uh, easily possible for countries that continue to prohibit, that do not want to uh, regulate cannabis, it will be possible for them uh, under Article 36 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union to continue prohibiting both uh, imports of cannabis in their country, but in their country, but also the transit um, in their country. So that's something that obviously this is just a screenshot, a short a couple of screenshots from this section, chapter four. But I invite you to to have a look. And the question of tourism as well is is very important. We often often think it's subsidiary, but it can have important uh, impacts. And like any tourism, cannabis-related tourism can be bad if it's massified, if it's not well thought through. And uh, on the contrary, it's also, I mean, it's also inevitable. Cannabis is linked to uh, travels for uh, from immemorial times. Cannabis has been a traveling plant, a plant traveling with uh, Homo sapiens across the time and continents. And it will continue to be. And cannabis amateurs and connoisseurs will continue to travel to look for the most different cannabis experience they can have. In this respect, um, 
it's probably better to anticipate, regulate properly, sustainably, um, um, a, 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 the best form of cannabis related tourism that we can, instead of leaving it become a problematic issue uh, in the future. Um, so that's all. I really invite you to get a look uh, at the report if you want to uh, to learn more. I'm happy to uh, hear your feedback. You can contact me here on on this uh, link. Uh, there is a contact form, and um, I wish you uh, very good uh, discussions and all of the best for your legalization. Thank you.